Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Petrus Kamen. On behalf of the Flanders Architecture Institute, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event. Uh, the, the event is titled A Cross on Tour, which is uh, kind of a, a reference to the broader project of a cross, which stems back a few years already. Uh, it used to be a partnership by, uh, uh, with, uh, between the Flanders Architecture Institute, A Plus Architecture in Belgium, and the uh, Université de Liège. Now we are joined by a few new partners, most, uh, first and foremost uh, Ika uh, from uh, our, uh, our French-speaking counterpart. Um, and, but uh, the, the goal of ACROSS has always been to, to focus on young architecture. And the title of ACROSS aims at, at the, the main ambition, ambitions of, of this series. It's uh, to, to connect uh, across the, the, the borders, uh, the, the linguistic borders of Belgium, but also to make a connection between different uh, uh, generations of architects, between, uh, between uh, more established architects and, and uh, uh, practices that have just started up. Um, for this year, we have uh, uh, had a new look at the format of this series uh, and how this has, uh, has come uh, to fruition. Uh, for this year, I will uh, leave the words to uh, Audrey Contas of uh, ICA. Thank you, hello everyone. Uh, we are, as Ika, very happy to jump on this uh, beautiful project across. And um, that's true that this year we decide to put eight architects from uh, both parts of the, uh, um, the of, of, of for both part of uh, Belgium, sorry, um, and to work on one uh, theme, which is transformation, and to make them uh, work together, and to, for example, by this kind of pr uh, presentation that we're making the, tonight, and that we have made in November in uh, Dornic, Tournai, um, and uh, we will finish with uh, an exhibition, and for that I give the floor to Isa de Vichy from APLUS. Of course, uh, tonight is not the end of uh, Across on Tour. We are on tour, which means that we are going to several places. And uh, the next phase of uh, the whole project will be in Brussels, where we'll, we'll have another evening where uh, we will give the word and the floor to the young architects, but where we also will have um, a beautiful exhibition where we will going to, we're going to um, show their work in the mud. Uh, I hope you know the beautiful museum in the heart of Brussels, um, and where we will show their work during the whole summer. So you will uh, be able to uh, come and see not only uh, the architects in person, but finally also physical work of them. So I hope you will be there. But uh, first of all, I would like to give the floor to Johannes Robrecht, who is going to give an introduction. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, I was asked to give an introduction to the eight offices, practices that we are presenting today. Um, and I have to admit it will be some improvisation. Um, when, when I was asked to do this introduction, um, <coughs> I, I had to admit that I was a second generation architect. Um, I never was in the position of these young practices that were able to show their first ideas. So, um, I have a clock here. Um, <laughs> you will have it too. Um, <laughs> um, I had never, never this opportunity. And at, at the same time, I had to, um, when I was asked, I had to make uh, a presentation of the office and its projects too. So I think the first part of my introduction will, will be kind this kind of uh, thought on how I was thinking about our own office. Um, and of course, um, we always start with presenting the space where we are and, um, and immediately um, had to go back to what the space is meaning for us and what the uh, history of uh, the office was. Uh, um, so the presentation became a kind of layering of ideas and projects and drawings and um, a kind of uh, way where different uh, images were telling stories to, to each other. Um, 
and kind of kind of a comic book where things were evolving from one ID to other IDs and where um, um, the kind of influence of uh, projects was becoming meaningful. Um, and in this way we, we, we tried, or I tried, as a kind of uh, second generation architect to, to think for myself uh, what, what are we doing, what were we doing. And I can imagine that for these young practices, a uh, kind of same question is there. How, how you will, wh what are we actually doing and what, what do we want to become? Um, so this kind of uh, presentation continued. Sometimes uh, movies were integrated from artists, Marta van der Beelen for this one, um, to, to have this kind of um, overlapping ideas, overlapping uh, weight of, of meanings uh, through, the, through the presentation. Um, And um, where uh, background and foreground images were trying to to give a new story to to projects and to to and for instance in this case talk about spirals and staircases and musicality of projects. So um, then yesterday evening I was still doubting on what to do. And I sent, rather late, I think, an email to these eight offices, <laughs> what they were thinking about transformation. And I said I didn't know what to do with it. I, 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 they, this was the email. Um, I'm not sure how, yet how to use it. That was true at that moment. And some of them replied, some of them even very quickly, uh, within half an hour or something, and uh, they, they gave this uh, beautiful answers today. I gave them colors. Um, don't need to read them. I'll read the last one. Um, this one is by Bau Club. Uh, Studio Ruben Castro. So there were five of those. And then I was thinking, how, how could you um, combine these in the same way that uh, I was thinking about this presentation I was doing? So tonight, this is the result, a kind of non-academic definition of transformation. And it became this kind of um, collage of sentences that I received today and yesterday. I will, I will try to read it. Uh, the, the letters are very small. We try to focus on different aspects of transformation. Our approach consists in the acceptance of what is. Before urban renewal and transformation projects are proposed, we find it often valuable to take a step back reflect and question the question. It, is this transformation even necessary? The nature of that first thought will have an appearance in the built environment. From transformation, we try to generate emotions and feelings of surprise and astonishment that follows a sometimes sudden metamorphosis of space. The dweller will experience his thoughts in his own state of transforming the experience through his own thought. In this conventional meaning, transformation is not necessarily something positive. It is a change from one state to another. Transformation is an exercise of undribbled opportunism. However, however, when we talk about transformation in architecture, we mean a positive transition that can unlock opportunities of existing building, a site, or a space. It is about the inspiration we get a celebration of imagination instead of spatial transformation. Can we build further on meaningful existence from forms of life? Can we strengthen them 
the relationships are kind by means of architectural and urban design. The state of thought being transformed by an act into drawing, which on its turn is changed in its form to a model, a model appearance is translated into an architectural drawing, and on its turn the plan is processed to a construction. In what way can and should the field of architecture and urban planning itself transform? Transformation materializes and concretizes the meeting of different moments and functions that the same element can represent with an optimization in the face of time. It does not necessarily mean a drastic change and can be achieved through subtle interventions which can result in major improvements of the space, the way it looks or functions or in the, or in the new way people comprehend the space. So we hope. So these are the eight wonderful practices that will show their work today. Um, I hope this was the order of the day, but apparently it's something else. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I read something new, I figured it out. So, um, you will start with whistles to June. Have a great evening. Thank you, Johannes. That was wonderful. And the time starts. Um, next slide. It's the other way around. Okay. Hello, my name is Marius. I will be representing Whistle Studio today. I work together with my dear friends, Leonard and Felix, sitting over there. I'm going to present uh, two projects we did here in Antwerp during the last uh, two, three years. One architecture uh, project, slow project, and one very fast scenographic project. <coughs> the first project is uh, a house we renovated in Berchem. Uh, you can see uh, the project as we found it on the left, and uh, it was a really solid house, but it had no connection to the garden, and it didn't have a lot of light in the living room areas. Um, we introduced the idea of uh, a concrete table to lift up the the massive uh, the massive volume where the bathroom was, which we wanted to keep. And also, in that matter, we could like reorganize the spaces on the ground floor. As you can see on the plan, the concrete table uh, drawn in, in blue it makes it able to, to make a sequence of four rooms, the two existing living room areas coming to the kitchen and coming to an extra living room area near the garden. And in that matter, we can open up the whole ground floor to the garden, and it enables the residents to, to live in an interactive way. Apart from that concrete table, um, the plan was orientated north, so we could use a lot of glass in the, into the new situation without the risk of sun. So uh, we always try to look at historical references and the theme of the presentation today is how we transform historic references into our new ideas and we learn from the past and transform it into new uh, details. We looked at the winter garden of the Ursuline Institute in Mechelen and we kind of filtered out the Art Nouveau ornament and transformed it into a new kind of detail which used some uh, smart principles of that winter garden but also uh, transformed it into uh, a detail that was able to build today also with uh, with the glass insulation so it's more than a winter garden it's effect it's effectively an, a real window so this skylight we designed we can put on top of this concrete table secondly because we wanted to show the concrete table in the interior because that is was the main uh, the main principle we added 
um, we had to insulate it from the outside. And we were thinking what kind of new facade we were going to design. And we didn't want to design uh, a very modern kind of, of extension because we saw a lot of them already and we didn't know where to position ourselves. And because this was the first time we, we renovated the house. And we were very charmed by this reference of Edward Hopper. And specifically in the way he, he drew the profiling of the roof detail. And we transformed this idea into the profiling of the roof of our extension. And um, it was a combination of, of zinc and then the gutter detail. And we tried to uh, transform it into a new kind of profiling. Next to that, uh, we made a plinth out of bluestone, which also reflects on the, the facade on the front door <coughs> and the street. And in that way, it, it, was a, it tied the whole thing together, material-wise. Um, we also work a lot with, uh, in tendering space with models 1 to 33. It's a scale we learned from Jo van den Bergen when we, uh, when we were in school. It's a very nice scale to, to, uh, to make a space which is not too big and still you can test the details we, we try to figure out during the tendering phase. And these models lead to the construction phase where we try to, uh, to get the goals we have in the models we try to realize in the construction phase. So the way you can see the picture on the left, we really try to try to um, to uh, to transform this model onto the construction site. So here you can see the the concrete table, which is, enables us to to uh, to put the big skylight on top, and the new wooden uh, kind of woodwork and glass we could put underneath it. Uh, for the design of the of the cupel, the, the skylight, but also the concrete table, we worked together with Friedrich Tonio, our uh, our engineer, who helped us to make this concrete table as elegant as possible. Next project is a, a scenographic project we did for the festival Contraire Open Air in 2019. It was the last wild summer before lockdown. Um, Michiel Helbig uh, from Kai Leuven invited us to design the second stage for the festival, the first stage they were designing together with students. And the festival site was, uh, was next to uh, the docks of Antwerp. Um, so the first thing, the first reference that came about was the dry dock next to the site. And the concept of the dry dock uh, a massive construction which enables to <coughs> control the water level so you can work on the boat. That idea we transformed into the concept of the stage where we could control the people that came on to the stage and it had the same kind of um, curved atmosphere. And on the right you can see first design sketches we made. Then we, we transformed the massive idea of the dry dock into a temporary structure because it's a festival for two days. So we used scaffolding, it could be rented. We didn't want to use any materials that we had to buy, uh, only rented material. Um, here you can see that, you can see the existing tree line, which was really important to, uh, uh, for the measure, measurements of the, of the stage. We wanted to, wanted to, to plant uh, in between the trees and in that way we also had a platform where people could also dance on top and look at the people that were standing in the pit and in that way it made some kind of um, intimate club setting. The DJ boot was, uh, was put underneath the staircase <coughs> and we made a monumental staircase because it was also the meeting point on the festival site. Um, you could meet there with friends so you can look uh, to the other stage and you can see people passing by that you know. Um, and in that way, it was a really social interaction on, on the stage, under the stage, in between the stage. And it worked the same way as um, the dry docks of Antwerp. 
Those are pictures we took uh, during the festival. We had the pleasure to go to the festival ourselves. Um, and you can see the, in the intimate dance atmosphere into the, into the scenery, but also the staircase on the right, where you could meet, where the DJ can enter, and also where you can <coughs> access the, um, the platforms on the side. And the last slide, I have 30 seconds, um, is, is, the, uh, is the picture that summarizes the project for us because we didn't want to add any material or color. So we used the existing scaffolding and a, a white typical fabric that they use on scaffolding uh, to, to capture the dust from falling onto the street. And the scenery was really, um, it was a really cold scenery without people. And the project really happened when people entered and you can see the colors from things that people were wearing, but also the lightning from, uh, from the DJ system made, uh, made the stage come to life. Um, so I showed you a slow architecture project and also a very fast scenographic project, because we think at Whistle it's really an interesting for us to do those two scales and those two speeds to keep ourselves entertained in a practice that is so uh, slow as architecture. Thank you very much. to walk around. <laughs> okay. Hello, <laughs> good evening everyone. Um, my name is Ruben and I would like to present this project which came about uh, after actually a series of very long conversations uh, with a painter who acquired this building 20 years ago. Uh, and this building is an old distillery near Hasselt where they distilled uh, the typical Geneva, the gin made out of juniper and grain. And he sort of, together with his twin brother, like very rigorously for 20 years, did like this typical Belgian kind of renovation, but with a lot of care. He sort of renovated the whole building himself. Um, he sort of also, how do you say, does this work? He, <laughs> sort of together with his brother, they renovated this part to sort of a restaurant they rent. His brother lives here and he renovated this part uh, for his wife, which runs a bread and breakfast uh, in this part. And this part is until today sort of a leftover piece, which is sort of standing as a ruin. Um, and he came to me with the question, yeah, I don't know really what I should do with this. Because he already has his painting studio in the back. And he was sort of wondering, um, can we do something with it? But I don't know yet exactly what the space should be. But the space should be sort of a place where everything can happen. And we came to the conclusion uh, that uh, we would make a proposal based on our conversations where we sort of uh, try to make a space that is sort of a cultural space where he can invite people to do a residency, but he can also organize a small exhibition, or he can also have like a nice evening with candles for his wife, and he organizes sort of a nice cheese and wine evening for the guests. Um, and I think in this part, what we really enjoy is this sort of observ observing of the existing architecture that is in place. And uh, it's also quite an exciting moment, and you also sometimes don't want to get past this moment because uh, you can still go anyway, uh, everywhere. But after drawing and sort of analyzing the site, um, we've 
sort of very fast saw that actually by drawing it out uh, over the sort of plans of the survey, that it's actually sort of a golden rectangle. So the space is exactly divided in sort of this sort of golden ratio proportion, which we actually quite liked. Uh, and this became sort of like a play uh, where we sort of then again made sort of like sketches that are completely by feeling, by intuition, that have nothing to do with measurements, but is just based on a feeling that you have, which then sort of transformed again to this sort of very mathematical sort of drawing that has sort of a respect to this sort of ratios and elements that are there on the site. And the idea is actually to have sort of, sort of a lower, sort of smaller windows and actually uh, a lower space and quite high windows that are fixed in the upper space. And this is sort of an outside staircase that would deal uh, as a circulation for three stories because on this part of the building, the level is a bit lower than actually the level you see here. And it's very interesting also to get into this stage where you actually go from sort of a survey to sort of an analytical drawing and then this analytical drawing becomes sort of an intuitive sketch and after this intuitive sketch you sort of again make sort of like a rational kind of drawing out of it and it's it's actually very um, fruitful to play with sort of these elements then to transform and make drawings over drawings uh, make the drawings that you actually don't want to make but actually by making them you confirm that your first drawing was the better one. And I really enjoy this process where you actually also do things that you think you will not want to do, but you have to do them in order to find out. And then from sort of this architectural drawing, we go to sort of a model, uh, a very simple model, which is just made out of cardboard. Uh, later we add pigments to it to feel more the surrounding because it's an old brick building that is completely built on the site. And we make it in a way we can also just sort of almost fold it up and bring it to the client. Uh, but the same way we can test with it, we can cut openings in it. And our approach was sort of going with like sort of a very sort of gentle touch to this architecture because in the end the place is already, has already quite a lot to offer and we want to do as minimal as possible. In the end what we do is we sort of add sort of a small gentle roof with upstanding beams so the reflective light in the evening reflects to the ceiling of the sort of canopy and reflects it back to the inner courtyard. The sort of steel mesh staircase becomes a lantern at night that makes sort of uh, lights up the inner court and sort of the windows they become sort of a play of proportions but that also generates a lot of light. Uh, in a way, you can see here the plan. Uh, the image you just saw was looking from here to there, where we then have sort of like a very sort of generous space with wooden columns that replace the existing ones because they are completely rusted. And we add actually a small core, which serves as sort of more a technical uh, aspect of the project, but also a small bathroom. And eventually later when they decide, you could even make an apartment out of it and it could become a small bathroom with a shower. The idea is actually, this is the front of the building. You would actually enter and there is sort of a main entrance here where you have a small like sort of bookcase uh, with a vestibule and a stairs to the upper floor as well here an entrance in this bigger space which you can exit again and take the other stairs up as well. Uh, and we also add sort of a small fireplace so in the winter you can make it very cozy and warm. Here you can see sort of uh, a section that we also made with the model to sort of study these sort of cores that become also sort of an element in the project. Um, you can barely see it, but we also add to the course to the sort of a bench where you can sit on and sort of also enjoy the space. Uh, so there are like sort of many ways how you can navigate through these uh, sort of generous spaces. Um, and I think we, we really enjoy this kind of process of like going from drawing to model and then actually jumping back to the architectural drawing. In a way, it really allows you to test with sort of real colors, real light, uh, real scale, because the model is in 1 to 20, so it's also big enough to take sort of photos of it. 
Um, plus, we can also very beautiful see how like morning light would like fall in and sort of like give like a different atmosphere uh, yeah. in different times of the day. We also test in a drawing like how can we give this building also a little bit of character uh, by having sort of a play of windows that we decide for ourselves. Um, Everything that is closed or fixed is on the outside. Everything we can open is actually on the inside. And this is sort of then, the entrance is then the only sort of exception because it is sort of fixed and uh, can move. And you can see here this sort of bookshelf with the staircase that goes up to this intermediate floor. And I think this is the beauty of sort of like, uh, of architecture that you have actually this power of going from this sketch to this drawing and then back to the model and then sort of make sort of an architecture uh, that is sort of in a search of uh, a space that can be used for everyone uh, in, in a sort of very generous way with sort of minimal uh, yeah, impact that we try to do in this project. Thank you. Hello all, um, thank you for being here. Um, when I was making this presentation and thinking about this main theme of transformation, um, I walked that day over this bridge. It's the bridge um, that leads towards my studio. And I thought this is actually a quite nice illustration of what this theme of transformation means to me in my everyday practice. Um, and so on the right side, you see the up, upside tower in Brussels with a lot of high-end uh, uh, redevelopment. On the left side, you see the former Allée du Cai, which was a very uh, inclusive space with a lot of cultural and subcultural activities and informally also gave a lot of help to uh, uh, homeless refugees. Uh, and it's being demolished at this very moment and will make place for a very fancy and calm and um, open park. Um, and somehow when I was standing here, I thought like maybe sometimes I like to take steps back as an architect and I like to reflect on the urban environment uh, and ask the question like, is this radical transformation even necessary? Or is it sometimes more interesting to actually build on what already exists uh, and to kind of layer uh, and, and work with uh, uh, values, uh, valuable spaces and valuable use of spaces that already exist? Um, so yeah, that realization brought me a lot into a kind of reflective practice and a reactive practice where I do a lot of research uh, next to a more uh, applied practice. Uh, but I show, uh, choose to show some of my uh, reflective practices. This is a project where I looked into the um, unprogrammed and undeveloped spaces of Brussels, kind of decaying spaces. Um, and I asked myself, like, what is the value of those spaces? What is happening there? And are there things that we are losing when we are re redeveloping them or even uh, um, activating them? Um, which resulted in a publication, as you saw before, and an image essay of Axel de Morteau, and also an exhibition that took place in Z33 in Hasselt in the format program. Uh, where I actually kind of synthesized some spatial models one-to-one -one, that uh, kind of reflected on the, the kind of architectural and spatial parameters that create these informal activities uh, in these unprogrammed spaces uh, and kind of translated it back to a kind of an architectural uh, way of thinking. Actually, to take these ideas with me with the idea uh, to, to include uh, kind of public, um, public privacy, so private spaces in public spheres. Um, and uh, when I see tr 
transformations, big transformations, and also changes happening around me, it kind of triggers me to ask questions. And the question that I asked here in this research uh, called um, Stad van Menslievendheid, um, uh, which it was uh, reacting on the, the many uh, transformations and renovation projects uh, on the social housing uh, uh, buildings in the center of Brussels, the kind of modernistic tower blocks that actually exist, many of them, in the inner city. Um, and I realized by uh, talking to a lot of residents, but also doing um, mapping, uh, that in fact, uh, through these radical uh, uh, renovations, a lot of people were displaced. And also the amount of social housing apartment is decaying in the center. Um, which, yeah, it resulted in a publication um, and also an exhibition. In my practice, I, I like to make these questions public again. So these exhibitions are a way, and also the publications are a way to, uh, to kind of synthesize my reflections, but also take another step and bring this publication, for instance, to the people who deal with urban planning. Uh, I was able to uh, uh, also talk to the Brussels Baumeister, and um, also uh, in this exhibition talk to quite some people in the Netherlands. This is in the Jan van Eyck Academy where I did a, um, um, a residency there. Uh, and during this exhibitions, there were quite some conversations happening, uh, which also was part of the setting. Um, but somebody told me, you should do this research in the Netherlands, uh, which we need you in the Netherlands. So I am, I'm, currently looking at um, uh, the renovation strategies in, in Rotterdam and Amsterdam um, to understand actually, um, yeah, how can this process of a, a lot of demolition uh, uh, change into a process of um, renovation without displacement? Um, so how can we imagine uh, places that are truly inclusive and take into account kind of uh, meaningful forms of life or small forms of life? Um, this, is, this is something that I, that I deal with in my practice. And one way is, in this case, it's a project that took place uh, in the square in front of the single here, uh, was to create thought images. Um, and I created this series of thought images within the setting of Laura Muldermans, which I was uh, able to, to use, the tables and the, and the uh, seatings, um, to make a configuration on the square and show my own practice. And it was uh, the, the thought images were based on the building of, of Leon Steiner on the single here. Uh, and it was an exercise for me as a designer to kind of how to build on things that are already there, how to imagine extra layers on the existing environment. Um, so I took uh, pictures uh, together with Elias Terlink, uh, and these, these photographs, they served as a kind of basis for uh, a kind of collages and drawings um, that were thinking about what could this public uh, inclusive environment look like. So, yeah, in, in, a, in a kind of taking steps back, uh, it is interesting to me to think of ways how to, f to find the existing values of, of existing spaces and um, how, as a designer, react on them and also take into account the, the social relationships that are already uh, in place, how to actually emphasize them and make, the, make them bloom somehow. And yeah, this way of kind of taking images and collaging and drawing over them is one of the kind of tools that I created for myself uh, to, to take really into account what already exists. Um, and that's also what I take into my applied practice. Thank you.
Good evening, everybody. Yes. Thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to present our work. Um, first, a few words about ourselves. My name is Maria Pashenko, and this is Kunz Habali, and we are the founders of uh, Pashenko Works, our architectural practice. Before setting up on our own, we uh, worked for various practices in the UK. And um, I studied art and architecture in Ukraine, and Kun studied at the Catholic University of Leuven and at the Architectural Association, where we met um, back in uh, 2010. We only have eight minutes, so I'll stick up stick to our speaking notes. Um, to illustrate what transformation means to us, uh, we will present two projects. The first one is a family home in London. We completed last year, and we will show um, images before and after the transformation, and some of the photos during the construction uh, to illustrate how we actually got there. And all photos of the completed project um, are by uh, wonderful Stan Bollard. So before the transformation, the house was a two-story period property built in approximately 1890s, as you can see on the slide. And together with two adjoining properties, it forms a charming, uh, typical for London ensemble facing Harbour Road in Camberwell in London, South London. Before the transformation, the house was vacant and deteriorating uh, for uh, many years. It had damp issues and uh, required extensive renovation to become livable again. Our aim was uh, really to unlock the potential of the old Georgian house and make it uh, suitable for a high quality living uh, requirements through our architectural interventions. And the photo shows how the atrium uh, brings the daylight deep into the plan, while at the same time uh, visually and physically connecting all levels. Um, it also uh, works in terms of sustainability strategy. Uh, it reduces the need for artificial lighting and um, contributes to warming up the house in cooler months, there is also an openable window in the highest point of the atrium um, to, and that provides effective natural ventilation uh, in summer. Go back. Just a little spoiler, sorry. Oh, that's not me. <laughs> it's a remote. Yeah, can you do that? Thank you. So, the design preserved and reinstated the main volume of the original building. The long section on the slide shows that the project consists of five distinct parts, which can be experienced in sequence when entering the building. First is the original Georgian terrace facing Harbour Road. Uh, two is the glass bridge, atrium that connects the old and the new. Three is a new built extension at ground and first levels. Four is a patio garden framed by five, a garden room at the opposite end. The space sequence is thought through not only horizontally but vertically as well. Uh, the ground floor is open, semi-public and noisy. The first floor is divided into rooms for guests and children. And the last top floor is a master bedroom in the newly added mansard roof. It is full of light and it's quiet at the end of destination traffic. Whereas we initially proposed a more subtle uh, roof extension, um, the, per, the parameters of the mansard were dictated by local uh, planning policy. Uh, the rare extensions, which are this, have been extended to align with the neighboring property. The roof pitch of the first floor repeats the angle of the historic V-shaped parapets of the traditional London inverted pitched roof. The exposed block work with high recycled content delineate, delineate the whole perimeter of the site, including the garden and the ground floor as a united team and adds thermal mass to the fabric. 
uh, the block work, steel beams, concrete floor, and metal deck, most of the materials have been left true and exposed. The new additions facade have been clad in off-white corrugated steel sheets matching to the aluminum colors of doors and windows, but also um, enables the feeling of lightness of the fabric and echoing the white elements of a surrounding Georgian fabric. Um, so the last in the sequence of the ground floor is the garden room, which frames and also completely opens up to the garden. The garden has been conceived as a patio between rooms of the house enclosed in blockwork walls. These blockwork walls have been treated as vertical extension of the horizontal surface of the garden and are used for growing climbers such as jasmine, grapes, berries and beans. The planting in the garden is a combination of food production and decorative landscapes where each contributes to the success of the others. Biodiverse turf with multiple wildflower species attract pollinators which in turn pollinate the vegetables and the fruits. We were striving to achieve a seamless connection between inside and outside. The materials palette, the light fixtures and the colors which were used in the exterior are the same in the interior, enhancing the feeling that the both form part of one whole. The traditional sitting room facing the street has been transformed into an office to allow for hybrid working from home and forms a buffer between the street and the private spaces. The desk allows for two people to work at opposite ends. It consists of a very thin tabletop of 12 mil birch plywood topped with burgundy linoleum. Four timber planks form the table legs and are black stained to achieve the effect of a floating tabletop. A cable tray underneath is put under tension for the structural sturdiness of the very thin tabletop. The design can be downloaded from our Instagram page for any DIY enthusiast at home. The office desk has been developed by us for a co-working project in Kyiv, uh, in Ukraine. We delivered a few years ago. The project entailed the conversion of a two-story warehouse on the fringe of Kyiv to make into a co-working community. The spaces were designed to accommodate various modes of working a combination of an open plan office, modular enclosed offices of various sizes and various meeting rooms and communal areas for informal interaction where opportunities for collaboration and exchange of ideas uh, and knowledge were maximized. In the busy launch, we placed a long collective table where everyone could join in, where accidental overheard conversations sparked common projects and inspiring collaborations. We were successful in creating a motivating and inspiring atmosphere of community openness, support, collaboration, and productivity, which holds today even in times of war. And although the scale of the project was relatively small, this transformation resulted in the creation of a productive ecosystem around it. And as a closing note, we wanted to say that while before and after images uh, show the as if by magic transformation, uh, the Images of construction show how much blood and sweat goes into every project on a daily basis. And uh, seeing the images before and after is uh, what is so wonderful about our profession. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So, what you have here? Okay. Yeah. So, during the first ACROS lecture in Tournai, we talked about transformation in the most intuitive and direct way we we thought about. So, we presented three renovation of traditional brick buildings. And today we wanted to talk to you about the subject through a larger range of, of projects. So the presentation will be on, yeah, it's going to be a difficult presentation. So on one side, uh, build projects, and on the other side, uh, research projects, as art installation or um, publishing works, by example. So one of the themes that are very close to our hearts and work is uh, time. 
in our renovation project with transform century old brick structures. And one of the main issues is often to decide and to discover how the old actually interacts with the new and if it actually interacts. If the dialogue between the two and uh, the new and the, the old fails, the project actually fails in its expression, but also in the message it carries. The goal is not to keep uh, or to secularize the past at any cost. The preservation of certain elements uh, does not make the project in itself, of course. There are simply choices, glimpses, imprints of the past users or past stories. One can, by example, imagine here in Villers um, what the building was like before or how people lived in it before. And, um, and yes, that's what we actually love. Beyond the practical, technical, or economical aspects of architecture, we find a very strong narrative potential in the act of building. We work and play with what is already there to give an additional depth to the project we design, to print out the more sensitive, poetic, and out of time dimension of architecture. Landscape is one of the subjects we like to think about a lot. So we try to preserve a certain coherence with the built landscape, whether uh, the urban or the rural one, like in this image. The brick in these cases is a structure material, but it also qualifies the space or the street, the chaussée or the public space. In a contest where um, more and more people have to transform these traditional typologies, a great challenge lies in preserving the constructive intelligence. Building are kind of moving bodies. They are constantly changing generation after generation, but some unchanging elements like materials or techniques remains and maintain a certain coherence uh, within an ever-changing landscape. Another one is a uh, structure. We try to keep a clear reading of the structure of our projects and we try not to erase the logic of the load-bearing masonry walls we work with and to um, actually hide it in various, under various coating, especially in those projects in which the brick structure makes the building's expressivity. So even when it might appear poor or somehow banal, we try not to smooth it out and hide it underneath insulation or seemingly for dry coating. Like in this project, by example, in Villars, we, we try to insulate from the inside. Um, yeah, we try to insulate from the inside for, of course, sometimes urbanistic and historic reasons, but also for architecture and architectonic reasons. We seem to us that um, the purpose is, is not to keep, it actually to keep the expression and the constructive logic which we consider to be a very, very strong expression. Sober, maybe sometimes banal, but very powerful. Does it work? Does it work? Yeah? OK. <laughs> um, so uh, another aspect that comes into our work, and that's the, the, this play with the diptych, is the idea of, uh, of working with fiction. So we, we think fiction is a very powerful tool to to relate, to speak about architecture and to say things that we're not completely able to say with architecture. So we like to combine the built elements that sometimes are a, an installation with a video or a book. In this case, this is uh, the Delva book we made uh, with the collective Pitch Lab uh, and also the editor Paper Meniers. And um, it's about the work we've done uh, on site and it's always this idea of experimenting and then reflecting on the experimentation. And uh, in this case, uh, it was just doing uh, structures that had not a real uh, function uh, on an abandoned space with the elements that were there. And it was all that came between the game of coming f uh, into fiction, then into reality, into fiction, and writing about it and making a false investigation around it. And all that comes together in a, another way of reflecting uh, about architecture. And we discover with time that that comes also back to our uh, daily practice of architecture. And um, 
Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> I forgot one point. And um, so what we, we like about this is um, this idea of uh, Bernard Rudowski that says uh, architecture is not an art or, uh, or something that you command or it's a, a need, it's an urge that people have to do uh, with the materials they have around. And uh, it's what we kind of felt in, uh, in during our studies and then afterwards one, once you're in front of your computer uh, almost all the time and uh, you're not uh, doing something uh, and, and building and then reflecting was something we, we really uh, cherish and we try to apply every time in our projects because we know that comes back afterwards to us. And we wanted to finish with uh, this uh, last intervention we did in Delva uh, that was a, a, a square uh, floor made on purpose with uh, these bricks and left without joints because we, were, we read just some weeks before doing that this uh, legend of, uh, of the column, of the Corinthian column and of how it became the Corinthian com column. So, uh, it's written in the 10 books of Vitruvius, uh, and the, it's this thing of a, a little girl that died uh, in a place in Greece, and her nurse came with a basket and left it on top of an acanthus leaf, leaf, and uh, she put a tile on top, and that was uh, like the image of uh, Durand is much more uh, explicit than what I'm talking about, <laughs> but the acanthus leaf came around this basket, and that apparently inspired the sculpture to do this. And we like this idea of the small elements of architecture like bricks and uh, like elements that you can take with your hand are elements very powerful that show the pass of time. And in this case, we came back during one year and a half uh, for each season to see how it, le it lived during these all seasons. So thank you very much and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. So the office is now two years old and composed of four associates, uh, Maxime, Florence, Morgan, and I. Um, during this very short time, uh, we'll bring you through three competition projects we did last year. Um, our common ground is to produce usual usable buildings which offer maximum um, of living condition for a minimum of means. So today we will not speak about program uh, since it's not really an obsession for us um, as it's versatile. We like this image of ruins in state of becoming. Uh, they are not demolished. Uh, the construction has simply stopped. It's not about program. It's not about function. It's about the potential of a building and how it can absorb one vision or another. We don't want to constrain, but to produce the condition for a building to be capable of reinventing itself in response to the instability of uses. We are looking for this essential and poetic form, which consists of taking all the parameters into consideration to create the story rather than focusing our attention on one detail or another. So the first project we'll show you um, tonight is the Faculty of Architecture of Liège. It's a competition we did last year uh, with Miotto and Beaumans de Fe. As the programmatic ambition does not match the budget, uh, we propose to intensify the activity where it already exists, near the workshops that you can see left and right the new building figures create um, an important urban interface that announces the presence of the faculty within the very hermetic site um, of the former barracks. The starting point of this ruined state of becoming is to offer all the structural and technical needs uh, necessary to implement the new program. And as mentioned, a program that is subject to change uh, since, we, since the budget was very tight. 
we are often seeking for a limited amount of intervention uh, that creates a maximal impact. It is a very simple building composed of a series of slabs, as you can see on the, on the right of the image. And it's fed by 10 shafts that are both the structure and the natural air supplies. The building offers two conditions, the upper floors, continuous slab allowing the introduction of mezzanines, and the plinth that acts um, as a public gift, let's say, uh, that is a large true square between the, between the two existing buildings and between the, the inner campus and the city. It's somehow opposed uh, to the introversion of the plan, as you can see, uh, that is really turned uh, inside, let's say, the, the plot. The second project um, is a competition we won end of last year for the, real, the realization of uh, circus artist residencies. And it deals with the notion of, the, of transformation, but at the side scale. The Pôle des Arts du Cirque et de la Rue in Marcha welcomes artists from all over Europe. Um, and it has to be understood as a single entity composed of um, open rooms and building. It's a village within the village following its own logic. And this village is characterized by the sudden change uh, typical of the, the seasonal circus nomadism. Um, we went beyond, let's say, the, the former brief consisting of the creation of, uh, of two artistic uh, residency by implementing the idea of an unfinished structure capable of evolving in parallel of the development of the pole um, and also acting as a supportive device. In the meantime, uh, the Marchand project is a pretext to talk about evolutivity. A parallel can quickly be drawn uh, between this thinking and the Japanese metabolic um, movement, which superimposed somehow the logic of superstructure and growing organism. The autonomous structure, uh, which is installed on the lagoon, the existing one, and pulls its foundation, uh, follow its own rules, and offers the possibility of integrating new residencies in the future without consuming extra land. We cherish this notion of time uh, in this project, referring also to the, to the work of Family Labourdette we showed previously. Um, the autonomy of each part refers to the temporary structure and give both phasing and curatorial opportunities. It is a recurring theme in our project to think about flexible arrangements um, that give extra space or tools hoping that one day they can be verified. Even if the project can exist on its own, it aims to be an added value to the existing context as the new technologies benefit both the building and the existing residencies. Last project, um, another second prize on a, on a second faculty of architecture with our friends from Sergison Bates. Here we clearly approach the question of transformation head on. The request is simple. The first phase consists of the energetic renovation of the facade. The second phase consists of the integration of the program. This phasing is linked to a subsidy and requires the first phase to be carried out while this building is occupied. Our response was to go beyond the conventional answer of replacing windows and uh, the system we propose on, the, on this project consists of extending the, the existing English courtyard over the entire height. This perimeter mediates the interaction between the, the existing plinth and the surrounding square, offer informal encounter space and opportunities, as well as an alternative circulation. This confident gesture was rooted in the overall climate strategy of the building, providing natural sun shading, a climatic buffer zone, while in the meantime keeping the existing building untouched and protected. This extra layer is conceived as a big scaffolding in the same logic as the existing building. That's it for tonight. Thank you.
you can Happy also do that call the okay. Good evening. <laughs> we are here representing uh, every island. We are actually five, but yeah. We are a Brussels-based collective. Uh, actually, we inquire and we are really interested in design of spaces and the performativity of it. For tonight, we wanted to deal with the topic of transformation by explaining that to us transformation is, first of all, a self-imposed question. And that question is, what is the minimum of element that need to be inserted into a space in order to change the perception that the people are going to have of it? Uh, for doing that, we are going to walk through some of our project, and for the first time, we are going to show it in plan. This because plan is not a tool we use for narration, but has been always a plan, as all uh, people with architect background, we use to communicate between each other in the developing of a project. Uh, this is the first project we actually did, and we were uh, confronted with the context of a big abandoned building uh, in the European quarter of uh, Brussels. The first idea that we had was to actually build up a narration, a sequence of spaces, and the focus was to change the perception that the people will have of the space, to disorient them into kind of neglecting this repetition of the concrete bare spaces, is repetitiveness, but actually creating new lines, new unexpected views by compression and dilatation of the space. This was done uh, by creating uh, from an elevator room to a overscaled living room to a bedroom hanging from the ceiling and kind of uh, playing with the boundaries of private and public space. And the second project that we would like to show you is actually a project that we developed uh, in Italy. So we were asked by a cultural collective from Ghent to develop a temporary pavilion. And since the first conversation we had with them, the temple, uh, the pavilion was actually defined as a temple. And so uh, when confronted with the site, this time a completely different uh, uh, situation since it was a public square in a small uh, city uh, of Sant'Arcangelo, we decided to approach it in a literal way. Let's paste a, a temple into the space. This was done to understand what are the elements, actually the minimal element that makes a temple into a temple. The answer was quite clear. You need a diaphragm, a colonnade, and you need an intimate space, an house. This to us was translated into a clear transformation of the space and by the use of everyday construction material, the sacrality of the space of the temple was actually put into question and irony and a different perception all of a sudden. The use of the material also um, uh, favorite the space of the square and the other elements that were already present into it in all of a sudden merging with the element that we use to create the temple space. The, <clears throat> the third project that we want to show, um, we were asked to uh, design a rave inside of a contemporary art museum in Luxembourg. Here we made the exercise to think about what if uh, you separate actually the different functions that a rave or a club would have and you place them, uh, you use them to structure the space. So uh, quite practically speaking, you have a bar, a place to dance and a place for the DJ. And uh, we, we took those three things and we put, we, uh, we put them in uh, architectural, uh, parts of the building, so we use the structure element of the column to put the DJ booth. We use the void space around the staircase to put the dancing cage and uh, the corner of the wall to put the bar. And then it looked like this. And uh, the third project is one that we recently finished 
Uh, this one was a space that we could use for three months. It was a part of a residency that we had in Casco Leuven. Here, we were confronted with actually two spaces. First one, the historical building in which the, the space of Casco is situated. Second one is uh, the more strong, oh, okay, how can I do this? Ah, yeah. Second one is these walls, which were actually built by the first resident of uh, Casco, um, which was a project that was never finished. Uh, so it was like it had a certain intention of a narrative which then was never realized. And we thought it was kind of an interesting uh, a basis. Uh, a building which uh, used to be uh, a brewery and then became an artist residency and uh, another room inside of that room which was supposed to be a space for gathering but then became like wide unfinished walls. Um, and what we then decided to do is to um, just uh, continue to knit a narrative or give different ideas about how this narrative could develop in the future for these two rooms. And what you see in red, all of the in installations that we placed um, kind of on the thresholds of the, of the um, walls. And um, then it looks like this. Good evening. So we are Beau Club, Kenley and Arthur. Um, since we were asked uh, a few months ago to think of what uh, transformation in architecture meant to us, we left a board hangout in the office and a semantic field came up uh, that we'll try to translate through eight images of construction sites and um, completed projects. So each architect has a different uh, attitude towards the context and nature of uh, transformation missions. Ours is based on the principle that transforming is always um, involved in any act of drawing and imagining spaces, and that it intrinsically involves working with existing or pre-existing material and elements. It is therefore a matter of questioning the attitude to adopt regarding this environment, present, sometimes pleasant, at days disturbing but un and uncomfortable, but rarely arbitrary. Our approach consists in the acceptance of what is that allows us to find a little lightness and joy in the act of and weight of building, realizing, concretizing in our profession. Made timeless from the moment you accept that you are only a dot on the timeline of a building, this relieves us and frees us from the weight of time and the act of building itself. Here we, can, uh, we see an example where the demolition revealed a sequence of openings that we could not uh, imagine based on the surveyor's job and uh, which today is an integral part of the project. As we can see here, we tend to leave everything in, in place and chose to take the opportunity to reuse, reinterpret, to show everything. Um, hiding is an admission of failure or weakness in our sense. This provokes spaces that are explained, are didactic, are clear, and aims for a certain sincerity. For us, the act of transformation in, in inherently involves working with pre-existing matter, um, and this presence must be embraced. Transforming is an exercise of unbridled opportunism. It is therefore necessary for us to take advantage of the imposed uh, conditions. This opportunism uh, relies thus on the presence of the existing material with uh, which we work and that it would be inappropriate not to pay credit to or to, to credit. We only try to input our point of view on a condition and adapt it to the new usage, usages and treat each element with respect. This hum humility regarding the existing uh, also decomplexes us. We must integrate it as a major parameter in the story we want to tell. Um, it's all about accepting the transition also for us. 
um, um, as soon as we accept a mission of transformation, we accept to be part of a story, and we are asked to continue it for one or more chapters in the short, medium, or long term on a small or larger, or, or larger scale. These witnesses of the past are therefore integrated into the exercise that we want to be as inhibited as possible. Transforming materializes and concretizes the meeting of the different moments and functions that the same element can represent with an optimization in the faces of time. This attitude confers us an optimism in the, in the face of past, present, and future contexts, and, all, and allows us to consider future-proof drawings as well. Fortunately, the blank page does not exist. According to us, with optimism come enthusiasm. What exists become, becomes the tools of composition. It articulates questions and confronts, confronts or pre established ideas. What interests us in the transformation is the tension that exists during the meeting elements and this conversation between the context and the project. The interstices of the conversation nourishes our curiosity and reveal the stakes of the project. Again, a composition playing with the existing condition and a new element. In this project, we highlight the different layers and materials that confer multiple ways of reading the spaces. We approach this meeting between the different spatial and temporal contexts like a big playground with, with all its ambiguities from which we try to generate emotions and feelings of surprises and astonishments that follows a sometimes sudden metamorphosis of space. Appearance has reversed and a new harmony found. We assume the exquisite corpse game when we approach the transformation project where all special accidents are accepted and welcome. We want to, re to reveal rather to disguise or hide the surprises in order to get out of the codes dictated by the well meaning or so-called truth. Imperfection is thus always welcome. In this project, sorry, in this project the old door is replaced by a new fixed frame. The pediment was built a bit awkwardly on purpose. Starting from the evidence that the cleanest energy is the one that is not spent, we try to play with, with what is. The questions of sources, quantities, circularity comes not in a second step, but to reinforce the, the first idea. Faced with the fatality of what is, is, and is here to stay. Again, this is surely not to be considered as an absolute reality. It is just one point of view that we try to put into place and allows us to be confident about the future. Around the transformation, we therefore act as witnesses of, the, of an encounter between all parameters and draw a story around it, where each actor or element has its role with defined character traits. It is up to us to interpret them and reveal with generosity what interests us with our own sensitivity and intensity. Thanks to punctual intervention, we sometimes manage to find new balances, which amuses us and plays with all possible complexities. When succeeded, the project only reveals what was what has always been there. Thank you. A short conclusion. Um, I, I came to learn about eight offices, and uh, of course I, I've, I've learned to know, uh, know them now, but um, it pro probably this was not what happened tonight for me. Um, I think I learned that experiment is what is happening in this, these young practices. Um, awareness for for context is what is happening. Um, what I've written all down, um, the idea of embracing temporary projects, fragile projects, um, and and 
I think this is very exciting to see that um, that in, in even in small commissions you find the freedom to do what you want. That's my conclusion. <laughs> Uh, that leaves me just to thank, uh, first and foremost, all of the architects for that lecture. Also, I want to thank again uh, our partners, uh, APS Architecture in Belgium and, and ICA, for uh, organizing this event. Um, as Lisa mentioned earlier, we have a, a third chapter to this tour in Brussels starting in June. Um, we specifically chose for this format not to do a QA and a in the room. Uh, but there's an opportunity to have a drink with the architects at the bar and uh, that would, if, with this amount of architects in the room, I think it's a more suitable setting to ask your questions there. Also, uh, I want to mention that the exhibition uh, on Marie-José van Hee is uh, still open until 10, I believe. So uh, uh, grab your chance to see it. Thank you. <laughs>